renewables is because they want to leave a better world behind for future right. generations. That intergenerational impulse is, is something we see and is really strong. But what are we, you know, you mentioned house building as one of the things that we can do to tackle this as a material offer. One of the other things that comes up often is, is childcare, that we need better yeah. support for childcare. That was a good was uh, a great win, onward did. supported yeah, yeah. win that we had kind of six months or so ago. But the risk with some of this stuff is often what it means is the state doing more, right? I supported the childcare policies, but they involved a massive increase in state subsidy of childcare. Some of the house building stuff involves big state intervention. H how do we make sure that as we're trying to win over younger voters, the impulse isn't immediately immediately towards the state? What are the respective roles of kind of state, family, community markets? So look, I think this is one of those areas where you've got, to, you've got to look at what the state can do and you've got to look at what you're enabling. And here, I mean, one of the things I think about when I think about the state is actually, funnily enough, about one of my first challenges in this post. Uh, many of you will remember when uh, Her Late Majesty the Queen died there was this extraordinary outpouring of grief and in many parts of the country people wanted to come together, many people came together in London. I can tell you that was one of the biggest security operations this country has held. But security wasn't about closing down London, it was actually about opening it up, but opening up in a safe way. You can't have crowds of people coming together if there is a risk that somebody might do them harm. You simply can't allow it. So the way you enable large crowds to come together is you enable people to do it safely. So there was a huge security operation, much of it completely unnoticed, but there was an enormous security operation conducted by the state in which, which enabled people to come together. Now that's, that's the way I think about the state in these factors. You're not thinking of always about the state providing, but the state enabling. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, we just spoke about housing and we spoke about multi-generational uh, you know, living together, not necessarily in the same home, but certainly yeah, yeah. in the same area. What you're talking about there is the state valuing family, not defining family. Mm -hmm. None of the state's business what a family looks like. Your family may look very different from mine. It may have one or two parents. It, they may be, you know, biologically or adopted. They may be male or female. It, that's, not, that's not my business. Yep. The state's business is to enable the environment that best helps individuals to succeed. And so enabling family, enabling multi-generational support, enabling the kind of childcare options or the kind of work options or the kind of uh, housing options that enable people to succeed is fundamental to what the state is there for. The state shouldn't be thinking about providing. The challenge when the state does provide, and this is the socialist model that the state should provide, is whenever the state provides, it has to, I mean, it just has to provide equally. Mm -hmm. And we're not the same. We're not the same. We want different things. We need different things. We need different levels of support. We need different levels of engagement. So what the state's job should be is to enable us to, to be valued as individuals sure. and to be able to succeed in our own communities and our own families so that the country succeeds as a whole. Is that a view that is, in your opinion, shared by young people, right? And you know, using a kind of yeah. broad, so let's say, let's say millennials, right? So let's say kind of uh, 18 to 40 year olds-ish. There is an argument that says that this generation that is coming through has fundamentally different values and attitudes, right? So uh, they are more likely to favor equality over liberty, for example, right? These are broad terms. Um, but therefore they are going to be more open to arguments that are made by the Labour Party or others and less inclined towards conservatism. Uh, is that the sort of argument that you find persuasive or actually do you think we're missing something? No, I don't buy that. And I don't buy that, I, you know, like many MPs, I speak at a lot of schools uh, every year and, and I meet a lot of young people who are you know, talking about their futures. Now, broadly speaking, because they're at schools, it's more 16 to 18 year olds than 18 to 24, but I, sure. I'm not sure attitudes change that radically. Uh, and I speak to quite a lot of student groups as well. And one of the things that really strikes me that's different from my generation, in my generation, everybody wanted to do well, most people wanted to join large organizations. They wanted to join the civil service. They wanted to join uh, the investment banks. They wanted to join, you know, the graduate training scheme at Mars or whatever it happens to be, right? They wanted to join large organizations. You speak to people today, many, many more want to start their own business. They want to start an app. They want to start, uh, you know, not for profit. They want to start, they want to do things that they have got real agency in, real, real control over, real, really enable them to express themselves. What they're looking for is they're looking for equality of opportunity. And, and they're right, you know, because equality of opportunity is, I think, what actually equality should mean. 
Because if, if you end up looking for equality of outcome, I can tell you what that means. That means a race to the bottom. It, it always does. And you know, Margaret Thatcher spoke about it, and many other people, even, even funnily enough, Tony Blair has spoken about it. You, know, you need to have the opportunities to succeed, but you can only have the opportunities to succeed if you can also fail. Yeah. And that's where we, as a society, need to get uh, better at valuing the lessons from failure as well as the lessons from success. Mm. And that's a, that's a challenge, but if we, if, we, if we really do mean to talk about equality, we need to be talking about equality of opportunity Otherwise, we're not talking about equality. What we're actually talking about is constraint. Mm. And how does tax play into that when it comes to young people? Because, I mean, a, a graduate now on an average salary yeah. faces a marginal tax rate of about 55% when you're adding things like student loan repayment and whatnot. It is mad when you kind of look at the graphs, at the incentives that they face as yeah. they're earning. And that seems to be where a huge amount of the tax burden currently falls, but it's not where a lot of the discussion is when we talk about reducing, uh, reducing the tax burden on different groups. Does that have to be a big part of the offer to young people alongside some of the other things you've described? Well, you see, I mean, you, you, I'm sure everybody's seen those tax um, threshold charts. Yeah. I mean, they look we're, like- We're onward, we love those things. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I know, I, I, you do, you're a geek. But the, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, but, but the you know, these are, these are tax camels, there's a double bump. Yep. And the first bump comes when you're in your 30s, you're, uh, you know, uh, you've got kids and you're still paying your student loan and your marginal tax rate can go as high as 70 odd percent. Yep. And there's a second bump uh, where people are uh, earning just over 100k and there's another marginal hit at I think it's about 65 percent at that point. Now that's not healthy and we all know it's not healthy and we need to actually be looking at ways of smoothing that. Now that's, that's not just about you know a tax giveaway, that's not what it's about. What it's about is about incentivizing people to take risk and to, to, to take the promotions. One of the best companies I've seen uh, operating in this space is Greg's. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that they do that I think is absolutely phenomenal is not just that they have you know, employer, uh, employee ownership schemes where you get a share of the, uh, a share of the profit. It's quite a lot of companies do that. Yes, it's important, but, but it's not the only thing. One of the things that Greg's does is it will offer promotions taking the risk itself because for a lot of people accepting a promotion if you're at a if you need to care for somebody in your family or if you need to have restricted hours for one reason or another you may not want to take a promotion because you're risking losing fixed hours for a promotion that may not work mm -hmm. and what Greg's does what you say have done is they have given promotions accepting that it may not work and if it doesn't work you can go back to what you had before now that's, that's a difficult thing to manage because that means you've got different people at different levels in the company and you're playing with your employee uh, matrix in a, in, a, in a different way. But it's an incredibly important way of making sure that people who you think can succeed mm -hmm. take the risk and demonstrate their own success. And the same is true for tax. If what you're using tax to do is simply to, in the, in the old expression, to pluck the goose with the minimum amount of squawking, uh -huh. then you end up with these oddities. If what you're trying to do with tax is to enable people to take risk and to, and to promote their own interests and to, and, and to profit in a way that actually benefits the whole of society, yep. then you're looking at a different chart. Let's talk about the economy more broadly because I guess you have... So when, I, when I've seen you before sometimes, you've been very clear that one of the best things that you can do for a business sometimes is step out of the way, right? Allow yeah. entrepreneurship to flourish. And I think that's a really interesting thing about kind of your politics, that sometimes you're identified as being a bit more on the one nation wing of the party, but actually economically, to be crude about it, you're quite dry, right? Someone that is keen on quite a small state and for yeah. uh, businesses to have the space to, to grow, to experiment, to innovate, to, to fail. How has your experience as security minister shaped your thinking about the economy? Has it made you uh, more open to or persuaded of the need for a bit of state intervention to increase the resilience of the economy. How, how has it, if at all, shifted how you think about the economy and growth? I think the most important thing that I've learned in this job is the need for resilience. Mm -hmm. right? If you have a single point of failure, that single point will fail. You can't run an effective economy where if one thing goes wrong, the whole thing collapses. You need to have distributed systems. You need to have different ideas. You need to have different people trying different things to find out which one will succeed. And so actually, 
forgive me, but it reinforces my point that the government can't pick winners, that it's not up to the government to make sure things succeed. It is, however, up to the government to make sure that there is a platform off which people can take risk. Mm -hmm. right. So the job of the government is not to go to some of the many startups that are here in Manchester and say, you're going to win, here's a money, you're going to lose, forget it, we're going to ignore you. But to create a platform on which those who have the ideas, the energy, the aspiration, and the, frankly the drive are able to succeed. And those who, for one reason or another, fail are able to look again at the lesson they've learned and start again. Mm -hmm. Because it's only if you get that start again, only if you get that, that re-injection of energy that you draw the lessons from before and you see the, 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 the ability to, to succeed. Look, if you look, at, if you look at the startup sector around the world, most importantly in the United States, of course, you see many, many firms that have been started by failure. Mm -hmm. By which I mean, whoever started it, whether it was an individual or a group of individuals, the first thing they did failed. It may have failed for very good reasons. It may have failed because somebody forgot something. Whatever it was, many of them failed. And it's only on drawing on those lessons that they've then succeeded. But what the government has had to do, the reason the government matters, is not because the government has stepped in to say, I support this or I oppose that, but because the government has created a platform that enables that. Now that's why you know, EIS and SEIS, investment schemes, are so important because they recognize that failure is a part of success. What we need to be doing is looking at how our entire economy needs to build together for that resilience. Because I tell you, as Security Minister, one of the things that concerns me most greatly is not that we can't rely on others. We can and we must. But we need to be careful who we're relying on and by how much. And if you want to see the most clear lesson on this, it's PPE. And you, everybody remembers in COVID that there were many, many different companies who were selling face masks and protective equipment and whatever it was. All around the world, there were all these companies. And we thought we had a distributed system where hundreds of companies were making this stuff. Well, it turned out it wasn't. There was actually only a handful of companies in China who were making it. They just had many, many distribution channels. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know. Yep. So building up resilience is absolutely crucial. And that's where thinking about who makes what where who our partners are, who's reliable, is absolutely essential to our security. Not what the government does, but what the private enterprise does. And I want to come back to that question of, of China and reliance as well in terms of your broader role on security. Yeah. But let me just quickly say one of the reasons that our economy sometimes lacks resilience is because of our skills and talent yeah. pipeline, right? That what we struggle to do, you know, businesses can't recruit, we can't grow in key industries, we struggle in some sectors or in some particular technologies where we might need to suddenly massively expand production or, or build onshore, whatever else it might be. Um, you wrote a foreword to a paper that we did a couple of years ago on apprenticeships yep. as being one of the really key ways that you could do that. And the fact that the apprenticeship system now didn't necessarily do what we wanted it to do. It was more about middle-aged current employees that were looking to do management qualifications than young people getting technical skills. To what degree have we cracked that? Have we made progress on the skills pipeline? And what more work is there to do? So first of all, look, the very fact that our education secretary is an apprentice uh -huh. is a fantastic uh, you know, demonstration that this government takes that seriously. You know, the left talks about it, the right does it. <laughs> you know, and it's absolutely clear that when Rishi chose Gillian to be Education Secretary, he was making a very clear statement yeah. that apprenticeships matter to him and matter to this government. He's absolutely right. Because this is not just about parity in the sense that we say an apprenticeship is equivalent to a degree. People need to feel it. People need to feel it in their bones. Now in Germany, for example, if you are a, a highly qualified uh, apprentice, you're known as a master. That's a parity of respect, parity of esteem. Mm -hmm. Here in the UK, too often, we have seen universities used as a social signifier rather than a real qualifier. And this is where you know, we need to be looking at apprenticeships for what they really are, which is a delivery mechanism for highly skilled individuals. Now, we used to have this in the UK. You know, when solicitors were studying, they were called article clerks. Uh -huh. 
when uh, doctors were studying, they went to med school, not to university. You know, these were forms of apprenticeship. We didn't call it that, but they were forms of apprenticeship, as in, you know, hands-on studying under experts. Yeah. We can get that parity of, uh, of, of esteem. We've had it before. And what it does is it really deepens the resilience of our, uh, of our skills base because it makes sure that we have that level of expertise throughout the entire system, and that's hugely important for us all. And before we move on to the kind of China and more formal element of your security brief, one of the things that businesses need in terms of that enabling environment is a degree of certainty and consistency. Yeah. And you know, a couple of weeks ago, we saw the uh, a week or so ago, the speech by the Prime Minister about net zero. Yeah. And regardless of the kind of merits of the individual policy announcements there, one of the challenges uh, that was levelled at the Prime Minister about that announcement was that what it damaged was certainty for investors, that there was kind of chopping and changing was difficult. Um, do you think that's a fair criticism? Uh, and, and if so, what do we need to do about it now? So look, I, I mean, I have to say, I think it's a fair criticism of every democracy. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the, the problem with democracies is, is we have to respond to people. If you, if you want certainty, the Chinese state will give you certainty. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, if you want certainty, Putin will give you some form of certainty, though it <laughs> may involve a window that you weren't expecting sure. to see open. If you live in a democracy as we do, you have to deal with the society as it is and the pressures as they are. And I think what the Prime Minister is doing is he's looking at what's deliverable and making sure that he can, quite rightly, achieve the end. What the Prime Minister hasn't changed is he hasn't changed the number of vehicles that need to be qualified, as it were, by 2030. What he hasn't changed is the 2050 goals. What he hasn't changed is the absolute commitment to achieving net zero, not just because actually it matters. As we all know, the UK's emissions are now probably below 1% of the global output, but because it en enables UK business to invest with certainty, knowing that we're going to achieve those green targets that will mean that, uh, so long as uh, various of us do our job on cybersecurity, the Chinese aren't going to nick it off us, right? Uh -huh. And that is enormously important. And what the Prime Minister is doing, I think, is making sure that those promises are deliverable, not just empty targets. Yeah. So let's talk about China then. I mean, when you were a, a backbencher and chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, you were very vocal um, about the you know, risks from China, kind of, yeah. you know, well, well defined and in a nuanced way, but broadly sounding an alarm that potentially we were not taking seriously enough uh, some of the threats that came from, from the Chinese state. Um, now in Security Minister, obviously you have a range of responsibilities relating to managing uh, that threat or, or things that emerge from it. Um, what do you think are some of the underappreciated elements of our relationship, of our struggle with China that might not get properly covered in policy discussion or in the media? What things do people need to understand that you've seen at the coalface? I mean, look, one of the things about reading the papers that I now can't tell you about, uh, but uh, <laughs> reading the papers that I read every day is I keep looking at them going, I kind of knew that, but it's worse than I thought it was. Uh -huh. And it, time and again, I keep thinking exactly as <laughs> something comes out. And the, and the challenge is that it's very difficult to get people to fully appreciate quite what's going on, because people quite reasonably say to themselves, look, who am I? Why, why would I be a target? Why, why would anybody be interested in sort of little old me, if you see what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's in intelligence terms, you're always looking for a needle in a haystack. But if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, first of all, you need a haystack. And what many intelligence services are doing is they are building the haystack of information in order to extrapolate future outcomes from it. So what China is looking to do is they are looking to build that level of knowledge into our system, whether it's our uh, economic system, whether it's our financial system, sometimes our political system, to find the points of pressure, the points of leverage, and then to find ways in. There was a you know, there was one of our colleagues in Parliament recently who um, very decently explained a phishing attack that had happened to him. An academic had sent a paper to one of his researchers who had forwarded it on to him. The academic, quite reasonably, didn't think of himself as much of a target. Mm -hmm. He probably wasn't. But through the researcher, got to a colleague, took over his entire computer, 
and has since made hay with it. Mm. That's what I mean by a whole of society response, and that's what I mean by, in some ways, it's worse than you think. It's also better than you think. Actually, the capabilities that our intelligence services have are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. We've got some extraordinarily dedicated individuals who are delivering some fantastic protective systems to the United Kingdom, and by the way, to our friends and allies as well. You know, we talk about global Britain. I think one of the most important ways in which we really are global Britain is the way that our intelligence services are protecting not just ourselves, not just the Five Eyes, but actually many other friends and partners as well. And that's an enormously important part. But you know, when I, I'm afraid when I, when I look at what China's doing, one of the things that always comes back to me is why Britain is different, why it is so important to the UK. And I think it's worth focusing on that. You know, we built over two, three hundred years, yes, building on the Dutch efforts, building on European partnerships, building on the US and all the rest of it. We built an international system that, broadly speaking, works in English. I don't just mean the language, but it works off concepts of law that we've embedded, concepts of property law, concepts of accounting, concepts of uh, administration that we built into it. China is the first power to truly challenge that. Mm -hmm. So it is a fundamental challenge to, UK's, to the UK's ability to operate in the world, in a way more so than other countries. Other countries are much more internally focused. European countries are much more focused on Europe. The United States has got a much bigger domestic economy. Mm. The UK is not just global by design, but is actually the artery, the arterial network of the global system. And so when there is a challenge to it, a rerouting, a rewiring, it is much more of a fundamental threat to our economy, whether that's the insurance market, the finance market, the accountancy, the services, whatever it happens to be, than it is to many others. That's why it matters so much to Britain. And that's why our response has to be so much more resilient. And what does that rewiring look like in terms of how we do security? Because I mean, for, for people that are unfamiliar, and I probably broadly include myself in this, you sort of think of our apparatus of intelligence being, I don't know, a chap with a newspaper with two eye holes cut through it, right? Like, what is the... What are the mechanisms that we have historically been using that might have been inherited from a Cold War era that might no longer be relevant? Um, and what capabilities do we need to develop? Well, you, 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 you've got an iPad, right? You know it's got a camera on the other end. That's the upgrade on the... Uh, on oh, that's the it, okay. Yeah, that's what it's for. Uh -huh. Didn't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, look, our security has, has changed remarkably, actually. And, and when you look, at, uh, you look at the way we're reforming um, our intelligence services, forgive me, but there's a lot I can't tell you about. But there's, there's an awful lot of work that's going in there. And in fact, some of it's building off some of the things I was talking about before. Some of it's building off apprenticeships. Some of it's building off uh, startup cultures. Some of it's building off a resilient economy. There's an enormous amount going in there, which is actually transforming not just the intelligence world, but actually the environment around it. Look, if, you, if, you, if it's not raining and you decide to walk around Manchester, I mean, for both hours in the year when it doesn't, mm -hmm. then you'll find that every place you're going to around here, there will be a small business, a small startup that is doing something creative and imaginative. You'll find the same in Newcastle, in Bristol, in London, and many other parts of the United Kingdom. And we are getting so much better at bringing them in in different ways and in reaching out to them. So the National Cyber Security Center, which helps them protect themselves, uh, and the NPSA, the National Protective Service uh, Agency, is doing enormous amounts of work at helping them defend themselves. But it's also drawing on them and drawing on the knowledge that they develop and the, and the imagination they've got. And that's hugely important. There's another area, I think, of reform that's really important. I mean, if you imagine your James Bond of the 1950s, if you like, as a white man from a public school background, where if you were gay, you know, you were, at the very least it was illegal and you were very often punished. If you saw our intelligence services today, there is no way you could walk into one of our offices and say, oh, yeah, you look like you know, a spy off central casting. Yeah. They don't. Our intelligence services reflect our society in the most complete way possible. And I really mean that. I mean, the number of briefings I get from people who come from every ethnicity, every sexuality, every gender, every, you know, every single spectrum of society, 
is enormously empowering. And it's not just empowering because it means you can blend in in a certain bar or mix in a certain community. It's empowering because what they're giving is they're giving through their, their, their different cultures, their different perspectives on the world. They're helping to address the challenges that we face as a community and to bring a different perspective. I mean, I, you know, I've had the great good fortune in the last year of being in rooms where it's my job to challenge, to ask what, what, what are we really doing about this threat, about that threat? What are we really doing? Have we got the resources? Have we got the approach right? Are we thinking about this in the right way? And to have people of different ages, different ethnicities, different genders, coming back with answers to questions I hadn't even thought of in ways I hadn't even begun to think of. Because what they're doing is they're looking through their own eyes, not through, as it were, the establishment eyes, as it were, that, that, that you'd think of from the 1950s. And that is hugely empowering. Now, that reform really matters. But there is a next level of reform we need to get to. Because actually, one of the things that our intelligence services have quite rightly been focused on is, of course, the collection of secret intelligence. I mean, that kind of goes with clues in the name, right? They are looking to find government secrets, steal them, and share them with our government to make sure we're better informed, better prepared. The reality is the world has changed in the last 20 years. So much of the world is now public. Now, it may not be public in the way that sort of you know, splashed across the front page of the Times, but the telephone directory is public. The employment records of many companies are public. The way in which governments are thinking about things, data sets are public. So much of the world is public that actually a lot of intelligence today is not about collecting secrets, but collating open intelligence, open information to understand secrets. Now that's different, and that's why, and you'll have seen at the back of the, uh, uh, of the integrated review, this government committed to setting up an open source intelligence unit. Mm -hmm because actually we would be the first Five Eyes country to do it, first of all. But that's where recognizing that what we've seen in Bellingcat, for example, mm -hmm. on exposing what's happened, you know, understanding what's happened in Russia by looking at Facebook, by studying you know, people's photos on Instagram or on Telegram channels, you can understand a hell of a lot. And what we need to be doing is looking at those open source elements and understanding better what's going on. That's exactly where we're looking at reform. Interesting. Okay, I've got loads more questions, but I'm conscious that I have been hogging the discussion and I want to open it up to the floor. Um, so uh, I'll take a kind of couple of questions at a time and then let Tom riff on them. Um, let's go with the question at the back there, one at the front here, and then if there is one more, I will take that one. Yes, one just at the front here too. So yes, just at the back, could you say your name and the organization that you're from? That'd be great. My name is Elizabeth and I am from Board Intelligence, which is kind of working on cybersecurity. Cyber so can you hold it? Uh, my hearing's really bad. Sorry, so no worries. <laughs> My name is Elizabeth. Thank you for, for being here tonight. Um, I was really struck by what you were talking about with China earlier, and I my particular question is around Chinese infiltration into the education system, yeah. in particular in higher education, and I'm wondering kind of what your, your thoughts are on that. Fantastic. Okay, let's take the question from uh, the front here. Thank you. Kat Sommer, NCC Group. I'm very heartened to see you talk about cyber and whole of society approach. Got a niche question. What are your thoughts on next steps for Computer Misuse Act reform? Interesting question. Computer, here we go. We're in the on conversation with now. Computer Misuse Act reform. Yep. Uh, Hi. Uh, good evening, both. Thank you so much for the session. Really informative. Uh, my name is Dan Laws. Here on behalf of My Life, My Say, we're coordinating the national youth voter registration campaign in the lead up to the next general election. So I was really interested to hear that I'm leading that this year um, for 2024. Um, one of the things we didn't discuss in depth was Brexit. Um, it's hard to you know, ignore it that 70% of 18 to 24 year olds wanted to remain. Just wondering what your advice would be to the Tory party going in messaging regarding trust. Um, I would really, really appreciate your thoughts on that. Thank you. Excellent question. Okay, so broad range there. Uh, China and education, the Computer Misuse Act, youth voter registration and Brexit. So um, China and education, look, this is something that does come up quite a lot. And it comes up in different ways. Um, sometimes it's connected to the Confucius Institutes, which are platforms sometimes for influence operations within our university sector, trying to silence debate amongst often 
students from China, overseas students from China, but also having a knock-on effect on UK students because they effectively create a culture of silence that our universities find hard to challenge. The second area that comes up quite a lot, I'm afraid, is uh, through research collaboration that ends up seeing ideas either stolen or simply bought and taken overseas. Now, these are both areas that we have very serious concerns over. And uh, certainly on the Confucius Institutes, I have, I think, been on the record for a number of years with my thoughts on this, and uh, they haven't changed, I'm afraid. Because the reality is that y you and I both know the, the Chinese state would not allow pro-democracy groups to be teaching English in Chinese universities. It is sometimes slightly extraordinary that the CCP has such access to our students. But perhaps more concerning is when you look at the amazing academic institutions that we have in the UK, which are genuinely world class. As you know, three of the top 10 universities are British. Uh, and we have some of the best research going on here in the UK that is gen then generating ideas. And then you look at who's funding or how they're being funded, or you look at uh, who is uh, studying in some of these sites, and you see that there are areas where, frankly, a few more questions wouldn't go amiss. Now, that's where I'm working with George Freeman, who's our universities minister, to see what we can do together. Now, just for the record, there are some fantastic universities and fantastic vice chancellors who are looking at this and understand the risk and understand the challenge, and they really are looking at it in a very serious way. Others have a different perspective. But this is an area where we really are focused on making sure we're getting the right answers for British universities across the whole of the United Kingdom and making sure that that uh, investment in ideas here in the UK actually delivers for the UK. Now, I'm, I love a geeky question, so forgive me as I go into the Computer Misuse Act. Look, let's not forget, it was written before there was the internet, right? So it, it is not exactly designed for today. And it's written in such a way that any infiltration on uh, a computer is by definition an offense, which is odd because it's impossible to have software today that does not automatically feed into uh, an item, uh, a, 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 an electronic item. It's also designed for a computer that is a standalone device. It's not designed for a computer that is a watch or a Fitbit or whatever it might be. I don't know what Apple's going to come up with next, but it's not designed for that. So there's a hell of a lot of rethinking to be done, and the government at the moment is listening because it wouldn't be right to uh, try and do this without actually having full engagement with many other sectors that have got opinions and ideas on this, particularly not the tech sector, which is, after all, the bit that needs to uh, be regulated in order to protect individuals, but at the same time uh, enable the successes that we've seen in recent years. So I think that is a huge challenge, but it, it, you're absolutely right that it that is, I'm afraid, slightly out of date. Um, and your point, towards Brexit, look, you know how, I mean, it's on the record how I voted, um, and it's on the record how um, my views on this. But I can tell you one thing, for simple, which is you've got to look to the future, not the past. The relationship we've got to have with our European partners has got to be productive and aspirational and, and, and future-focused. You know, we can look at the past, and depending on how you count the last 3,000 years, 5,000 years, I don't know how you want to count it, but let's say 3,000 years, you can look at European history, and there are periods where we've been to war with each other, there are periods where we've married each other, periods where we've invaded, periods where we've traded. You know, this has ebbed and flowed, right? It is unquestionably the case that with or without Brexit, our relationship with our European partners has almost never been better. The level of engagement, the proximity of relationships, not just because my wife is French, but the proximity of relationships has never been closer. You see young people coming and going, studying in different places. You see, and tech enabled now, you see the most extraordinary businesses where uh, enabled by uh, fintech based here in the UK or sometimes coming out of Estonia or other places means that you have companies that exist nowhere but online where people are being paid through apps 
that work out tax, that work out exchange rates, that work out share ownerships, all automatically. And so you have a Europe that exists in many ways, whatever agreements we have. Now, does that mean that we should stop our aspirations with the Windsor Accord? No, absolutely not. And, and Rishi certainly wouldn't suggest that either. You know, what we need to be looking at is a Europe that works for all of us. And in some ways, that will be youth exchange schemes. Canada has a youth exchange scheme with Sweden, for example. It doesn't have one with Romania. That's their choice. We have a defense agreement with France that we don't have with Germany. That's our choice. We have intelligence sharing agreements with, well, I won't go into them, but with different European partners and not with all. That's our choice. And we need to be better at looking at how that bilateral works at different ways to improve the opportunity and the outcome for all of us. So you can, if you like, you can repeat the psychodrama of the last six years and talk about having another referendum and another vote and another whatever. Or you can look to the future and you can look at the bits of the European economy, the bits of the European society that you want to work with and find ways of making it work. And I think that's where we need to focus and as Conservatives, where we need to be looking for partners and friends. And I think we can do that. Can I push you a little bit on that Brexit? Yeah. So we did a report, Missing Millennials, a little while ago and didn't give a huge amount of priority to Brexit and an explanation of why millennials weren't voting for the Conservatives, partly because it didn't come up in the polling. What did come up was um, a feeling that the Conservative Party were dishonest, right? There was something about them not being clear and candid. And I think you're absolutely right, adopting a sort of rejoin type narrative would be a disaster. But some of the arguments against us were, if the Conservative Party were more honest about some of the negative impacts of Brexit, particularly in the last few years, the disruption that it's caused, and the fact that very few of the material benefits that were meant to come from it have materialised, or certainly have materialised for young people. And so they would argue, that just a bit of candor about that would be useful in persuading those voters. Did you find that argument persuasive? So look, I'm not going to lie to you that there haven't been challenges. From, of course there have been challenges. You, 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 you're in a treaty agreement for 40 odd years and then you, you get out of that treaty agreement. Guess what? There are challenges. Yeah, sure, there are. You know, the, our membership of the European Union lasted roughly the same time as the Hohenzollern Empire in Germany. You know, Imperial Germany was about 47 years total. You know. These things cause frictions, right? When you, when you join or you leave organizations, there are frictions. That's true. But I think the way that we're approaching it you know, will result in different ways of approach, you know, different, different benefits too. And if we engage with uh, European friends in a positive way, then we can certainly have the opportunities, or different, sure, but opportunities from our European partnership. But we can also have benefits from other things. So one of the things I'm you know, genuinely really pleased about is you look at uh, what um, Kemi and Rishi have achieved by signing the CPTPP. Mm -hmm. Now, the Comprehensive and Progressive, because we're all Canadians now, Trans-Pacific Partnership is enormously important because that is a massively growing part of the world. And you know, you've heard me talking about China, you've heard me talking about uh, China's attempts to reshape the world. Our engagement in organizations like C CPTPP is hugely important to make sure that we are shaping the world too. Yeah. And so actually, you know, let's not pretend this is all negative or all positive. It's a choice, right? And choices have upsides and downsides. They just do. Mm -hmm. One of the choices we made recently was to leave the European Union and to focus on uh, other parts of the world. Well, that's what we're doing. Our relationship with the CPTPP is enormously important. Our relationship with India is enormously important. And you heard me talking about that far too often, probably, Adam. Mm -hmm. But our relationship with India is enormously important. Our relationship with AUKUS is enormously important. Yeah. And, you know, there will be others too. I mean, you know, personally, I look at Nigeria today and see enormous amounts of hope and opportunity. You know, there are many parts of the world we need to be focused on as well. And if you look at modern Britain, one of the things that's striking about modern Britain that is different from modern Europe is quite how international modern Britain is. You know, if you look at who Europeans in their 30s have married, they've mostly married other Europeans, normally people from their own country, but other Europeans. If you look at who Brits in their 30s have married, yeah, it's mostly other Brits, that's true. But it's people from around the world. Mm -hmm. It's not Europeans. Yeah. Not exclusively, of course. There's a few of us who made that bold choice. There you go. That's the pitch. <laughs> um, good. OK, let's take a few more questions. I think there's some hands that shot up. Uh, one there, uh, one from the back there. And then that might be all we've got time for. So let's go with the one here. Just wait for the mic to come. 
and speak directly into it. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Um, I'm Ethan. I'm from the Manchester Young Conservatives. Um, I just wanted to ask, as a young person, um, I know other young people are quite worried by the threat of um, AI and the security risks that could um, have for us, especially in the future, not necessarily now, um, but 20 years down the line, um, as a young person, I'm quite worried about the threat of AI. So I don't know if you can give us any assurances that yeah. what you're doing might be able to cut out that threat for future. Thank you. Very good, thank you. And then question at the back. Hi, Rhiannon from Marshall. Um, I've actually got two questions. Um, so the first one um, is around, you've kind of talked about trade, you've talked a bit about defence and what we're doing there, and also kind of Five Eyes relationships, NATO, that type of thing. Um, I guess my question is, how are you using kind of the brief, the security brief, to kind of feed into those other agendas across government mm. and kind of be being that convener of our security in those conversations and is there a role for industry yeah. in kind of the stuff you're doing and what does that look like and what do you want to see? Okay um, so the question on AI is huge uh, as you know and it's hugely transformative as well I mean at the moment as you know we're dealing mostly with large language models that are actually really more machine learning than they are uh, artificial intelligence it's it's less, art less artificial and more uh, and more mechanical but the, but the reality is these problems are growing. The problems are also opportunities. Uh, we're, we're going to be seeing huge efficiencies in the way we analyze information and we, the way we extract useful data from the haystack that I mentioned earlier. So in many ways that will make life more secure. I mean one of the things at the moment is, uh, I won't tell you how many, but it takes an awful lot of people to follow one terrorist suspect, for example. But as you get better at AI, uh, as AI gets better at helping you, you're more able to narrow down uh, the targets you're looking for, the reasons you're following people, and therefore your ability to focus your efforts against specific targets. It's also true, um, however, that AI will throw up many challenges. And this is where I think the government is doing uh, absolutely the right thing. And if you see what the Prime Minister's organized for the beginning of November, this AI summit, I think this is a really important way of getting that conversation out there. If you like, it's a uh, it, it's, a way about talk, it's a way of talking about the Manhattan Project before you build the bomb. Now that's a, that's a really healthy thing to do. Mm. You want to have a nuclear non-proliferation treaty before anybody's got a nuclear bomb. That's what we're trying to do. And I think it's incredibly healthy that we're doing it. Now it's going to throw up challenges. I'm not going to lie to you, it is going to throw up challenges. But those challenges are real for us because they throw up different ways of understanding how we uh, operate in uh, our space. I have to say if I were Chinese I'd be even more worried. And the reason I would be is if you're Chairman Xi, a lot of your control depends on control of information. And what artificial intelligence promises to do, we'll see how it delivers it, but what it promises to do is to change the way in which information is controlled. And that change in informational control is hugely challenging for authoritarian states. And it really undermines their ability to deliver the promises that they have made now. We have to continue this conversation to see how it evolves. But I wouldn't be too concerned at the moment. I'd be focused on what we can achieve and how we can shape friends and partners to make sure we deliver. Um, Rhiannon, you asked about uh, trade and NATO. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of my role, as you know, is focused on day to day, I'm afraid. You know, uh, what the Iranians are doing every day in trying to if I put it politely, I'd say disrupt, if I were to be, put it bluntly and honestly, uh, kidnap and kill um, people in the United Kingdom takes up an awful lot of time. What the Chinese are doing in order to hack into our systems takes an awful lot of time. And I'm afraid what the Russians are doing uh, through ransomware and many other things takes up an awful lot of time. But you're right that having a, a, an ethos of security through our systems is incredibly important. And that's why the work that we're doing uh, in terms of building up resilience in our supply chains, which we do alongside uh, the Department for Business and Trade, and Nuzgani is absolutely brilliant at this, uh, is incredibly important. So, you know, injecting that level of thought into it is what I'm trying to help do. A lot of the time I don't need to because actually Nuz is brilliant on this, but, uh, but there's an awful lot there. And your second question about industry is absolutely essential. Look, the reality is that the great strength of our country is that the state doesn't try to do everything. The enormous strength of our country is that Businesses around the country 
some of them one person at a computer, some of them a thousand people with sites all over the, 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 the continent, let alone the country, are coming up with ideas that answer questions that we didn't even know we needed to ask. And that partnership between industry and business and, and government is absolutely essential to our national security. It's absolutely fundamental. And one of the most interesting things I do is see pitches from companies who are pitching into the intelligence work, into our intelligence community. And you find out things that you had absolutely no idea could be done mm -hmm. in ways that you had no idea were possible in order to answer questions you didn't even realize you needed to ask. And it's phenomenal to see what the individual creativity can have when it's unleashed. You know, the left constantly tells us that the state can answer the question. We as conservatives know free people answer questions freely. And that's how we get the best answers out of our whole society. Fantastic. We might have time for another question or two. Yeah, but your hand's shot right up there at the front. Uh, so let's go with that question. If there are any more, we can take them in this round. But if not, then let's go for this one. Thank you. Um, Deborah Taylor, Deputy Leader of Leicester County Council. Um, just a quick question about asylum seekers that are coming over on the small boats. Do you think that creates a huge security risk for the UK? So just a softball question to finish with. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to lie to you that it's, uh, that it's a challenge, right? I mean, I, 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 it takes up quite a lot of, quite a lot of space. Uh, in terms of thinking about how we, how we deal with it. We are getting increasingly good at making sure we shepherd those who come off small boats into reception centers and we analyze who's there and we make sure we know what's going on and through various uh, different ways. In fact, some fantastic private companies that have demonstrated some capabilities we're able to do many things upstream that, forgive me, I'm not going to expose to you right now, which mean that the, the risk is certainly mitigated. That said, you know, there's a reason we're focused on stopping the small boats, right? There is an absolute reason we are focused on regular migration. Look, we as conservatives believe that people from around the world who qualify, who have an interest or, you know, have a need, should be able to come to the UK. We absolutely believe in that. I mean, if you don't believe me, look at what we did with Hong Kongers, who we welcomed with open arms. Look at what we did with Ukrainians, who we welcomed with open arms. We absolutely do believe that we have a role and a duty in, you know, in the world to welcome those in need or, or who offer an opportunity to the UK. And I'm, you know, I'm very proud of the way that Rishi has led on various of the visa schemes, including you know, this uh, global opportunity scheme where if you've been to one of the top universities in the world, you can get a, a visa for two years without a job just to come and see. But all of that only works if you also have a, responsibility, you know, a responsible attitude to your border. And this is where, forgive me, I find Labour just frankly disingenuous. When they take, talk about safe and legal routes, they're ignoring all the safe and legal routes that we already have. They're ignoring all the opportunities that we already give and saying that what we actually need to be doing is we need to be building a bridge from Calais to Kent. Now, that's not the right answer. It's really not the right answer. But it's also not just the right answer that we can close the border at Dover and pretend that upstream pressures don't count. And that's where the work that Rob Jenrick has been doing, unsung, uncelebrated, has been so important. Rob Jenrick, as you know, is the immigration minister and I have been working with partners in Southern Europe and around uh, the region. I've been in Iraq recently and talking about those upstream pressures. Because actually, it's not just the numbers who get to Dover, it's the numbers who arrive at Calais. And that's why what, mat what happens in Lampedusa, what happens in Italy, what happens in France matters to us. So we're working with partners in Europe. And this to the gentleman behind you's question about how do we work together with our European friends. This is one of those areas where we're offering huge capabilities, and I'm not going to advertise, uh, to help interrupt some of those migrant routes is so important. Because let's, let's be absolutely clear. It's not just that we already offer safe and legal routes. It's not just that we already recognize our responsibility to a wider society. It's not just that it would also be wrong to reward those who are breaking the rules and undermining our borders. It's that the trafficking that leads to it is one of the worst crimes that we are seeing in the world today. You know, we quite rightly focus, quite rightly focus on the English Channel and on the threats 
there. And it's absolutely right. And when we see capsized boats and people drowning in the channel, quite rightly, we feel that pang of anguish and pain that any human suffering brings. And it's absolutely right we focus on that. I can assure you that the information that I see that doesn't just show that the English Channel is dangerous, the, Ch the Mediterranean is even more dangerous. And if you think the Mediterranean is dangerous, look at the Sahara. Human trafficking and illegal migration is leading to some of the worst elements of human misery that this world has seen in many, many years. Every single mile along that Sahara route is marked by bodies. Every single arrival in Libya is matched, sadly, by the trade in human beings for sexual exploitation or simply for labor slavery. It is an absolutely horrific trade in human beings. And the last mile is the crossing at Dover. We need to be upstream and stopping it, not just about our own security, but because it's the right thing to do, it's the humanitarian thing to do, and it's the responsible thing to do for every country. Well, Tom, thank you. It feels like a somber note to, to end on, but um, thank you for indulging a very wide-ranging conversation on a, a, a range of different topics. Certainly learned a lot about your, your politics, your brief, and got some tips maybe on being a bit more cautious security-wise than we might have been before. Two-factor two -factor authentication. Uh -huh. Change your password. Yep. If you do the simple things right, you'll be okay. Okay, very <laughs> good. The British government says... Um, Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Thank you to you all for coming along and for offering your <coughs> questions. I feel very bad for sort of jettisoning you out into this extraordinarily rainy Manchester evening, but that, that is what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for coming along. I hope to see you at one of our events tomorrow. Please take a water bottle on your way out. Thank you, round of applause.